Chapter 13. Gran planned out the rest of the weekend for me. I had to do everything in my power to help Zoe settle in. That meant clearing some of my stuff from the guest room. I have a lot of stuff. Old soccer uniforms, a dozen pair of sneakers that don't fit me but are too important to throw away, tests I never got around to showing Gran, and that was just one layer of junk in the closet. Once the guest room was sort of clean, Gran made me sit down to finish correcting my social studies test. I even had to fix my spelling mistakes. That took forever. Now it's Monday morning, back to school. Before Zoe and I leave for the bus stop, I say goodbye to Mitzi. Her owners are coming to pick her up today. Make sure Gran tells them that lie down means come, I tell Mitzi. She licks my face, a very polite doggy goodbye. I'll miss her mixed up ways, strange but true. When I get on the bus, I find an empty seat so Zoe and I can sit together. But she takes a seat next to Caitlin Simboro. And by the time we get to Elizabeth Blackwell Elementary, Zoe and Caitlin are acting like best friends. And Gran told me to watch out for her today, this being her first day at a new school and all. Go figure. My class has library on Mondays. I usually hate it, but today I'm grateful for the quiet. It gives me a chance to think and plan. I find a table by the window and make a list of what I know about the puppy mill so far. Litter of sick collies sold at the farmer's market. Black labs, too. And the mutt. The guy lives on Lafayette Road. I chew on my eraser. I don't know much. What should I do next? I doubt they have a book that lists people who don't take good care of their pets. I suppose I could ask a librarian, but I hate asking for help. It makes me feel stupid. I look around. Everyone is actually doing their homework. I see Sunita sitting on the floor, her feet tucked neatly under her legs. Gran told me to think about asking the kids for help. Sunita is the smartest of them, no question. And she's the sweetest. I bet she won't make me feel stupid. Here goes. I walk over and explain my problem. Wait, I'm confused, Sunita says. What are you going to do when you find this man? I don't know, I admit. I hadn't thought that far ahead. She closes her book and stands up. There have been some laws about animal abuse passed recently. That's where we should start. Come on. She heads for the reference desk. Do we have to ask a librarian? Yes, we'll find what we need faster if Mr. Margate helps us. She smiles at Mr. Margate and explains what she's looking for. He pulls out a giant book from the shelf by his desk. You want information about the puppy mill law, he says. It'll be in here. This book contains all the laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We carry the book to my table and I open to the table of contents. The words look like, a, like millions of ants marching down the page. All I can do is stare. What's wrong? Sunita asks. I look at her. I have to ask her help. Sorry, I have to ask her to help me read. If I don't, I'll never be able to shut down that puppy mill. Um, I, it's just that, well, I don't read so good. It takes me forever, and then I forget what I just read. I can feel sweat on my forehead, and my stomach is ready to bolt for the door. If she laughs at me, I think I'll die. Oh, that's not a problem. I'll help. That's it? That's all she's going to say? I wish Gran would take that attitude. Sunita scans the table of contents, flips to the index, then dives in. It's like watching a great author or something, the way she reads so fast and scribbles notes. Voila, the Dog Purchaser Protection Act, section 9.3. Okay, here's the deal. People who raise puppies for sale are required to provide them with a healthy environment. Well, he didn't do that. They also have to be honest about any diseases the puppies might have. He lied, strike two. They have to make sure the pups are given the proper vaccinations and they aren't allowed to treat them badly. We've got him. This guy is really breaking the law. Excellent. What can we do to him? A couple of years ago, it was totally legal to mistreat puppies. Now, anyone who breaks this new law has to pay big fines. He could even be sent to jail. That's so great. Shh, Mr. Margate hisses from across the room. That's so great, I whisper. We can shut him down. What do we do next? Sunita asks. She's just as excited as I am. Hang on, I better write this down so I don't forget it. This is important. 
Dog Purchaser Protection Act, Section 9.3. Breeders have to provide a good place to live, vaccination, health records. If not, fins, fines, jail. You spelled some words wrong, Sunita says. I don't care. What matters is we can put this guy in jail. Or at the very least, put him out of the dog breeding business, says Sunita. But we have to find him first. Guess where we have to look? I know, I say. Back to the librarian's desk. Twice in one day. I wonder if I'm going to have an allergic reaction. Mr. Margate takes back the law book and shows us where we can find a special phone directory that lists people by address. After Sunita corrects my spelling of the street name, we find the listings for Lafayette Road. They take up three pages. If I have to call everyone on this list, it will take forever. I need help. What are you doing after school? I ask Sunita. The bus ride home is loud and bumpy as usual. What's different is that Sunita is sitting next to me instead of her usual seat behind the driver. She has to shout so I can hear her. Even with both of us, it could take days, she hollers. What do you mean? She opens her binder to a page of calculations. I did the math, 50 names per column, three columns per page. Three pages of columns equals 450 names. Even if each call takes three minutes, it will take the two of us more than 11 hours. You're joking, she shakes her head. What if Brenna helps us? She slides her calculator out of a special pocket in her binder. How does she keep a notebook that neat? 7.5 hours. And if we add Zoe? About five and a half. I would still take two afternoons of calling. Gran wouldn't let four of us stay on the phone from 3.30 until 9 p.m. I look at the back of the bus. David is making faces with his buddies, turning up his nose and crossing his eyes. I can't believe I'm going to do this. And David? If there are five of us taking 90 names each, three minutes a name, it comes down to four and a half hours. That's less than half of what it would take if it were two of us. Oh, and if you do it alone, she pauses for a quick calculation, it will take 22.5 hours. I have to take back what I said to my teacher about math being useless. Each time the bus stops, I scoot down the aisle to talk to one of the others. Brenna is drawing a peace symbol on the back of her left hand with a green marker. She agrees instantly. Zoe is two rows back, sitting with the Conover twins, who are the coolest kids in fifth grade. When I ask her if she'll help, she smiles and says, Sure, Mom always said I was good at talking on the phone. As I step to the back row, the boys freeze. I still can't believe I'm doing this. David, do you want to come to the clinic? We need your help. His friends erupt into screams, hoots, and hollers. He blushes, which makes matters worse. I turn to walk away. This was a stupid idea. David yells loud enough to be heard over the noise. I'll be there. I stumble back to my seat and sit, ba sit back down next to Sunita. Remind me again why we're doing this, I mutter. The bus lets us off at the corner. We troop into the clinic, me at the head of the pack and Zoe bringing up the rear. Dr. Gabe is searching through the piles of paper on the receptionist desk. Hi, Gabe. Where's Gran? She's out on a call to Mr. Barber's, he explains. Hoof rot. Again. Mr. Barber will, ta will talk forever, I say. We have all the time we need. Sunita hands out the photocopied phones phone... Sorry. Sunita hands out the photocopied phone lists, and I assign people to the telephones. David gets the house line in the kitchen. Zoe takes the phone in Gran's bedroom, and Sunita calls from the phone in the lab. Before she starts, she disconnects the modem and attaches it to an old phone, so Brenna and I each have a phone to use at the receptionist desk. And there's still one line open for incoming calls. Having six telephone lines is another advantage to living next to the clinic. Okay, guys, listen up, I say as we gather around the kitchen table. This is really important. If we can find the puppy mill, then we can rescue the rest of the dogs and shut this guy down for good. But first, we have to find out where they are. Don't rush, and make sure you call every number. What do we say? Sunita asks. I'm not a very good liar. You don't have to lie. Just ask if they have puppies for sale. Say you got the number from a friend. Which is the truth, Brenna points out. 
Those puppies are counting on us. Start dialing. We get to work. Dial, ask, and hang up. Dial, ask, and hang up. Brenna is great at this. Her voice sounds so confident. I'm having trouble. I keep getting wrong numbers. I always get wrong numbers. Brenna hangs up her phone and watches me dial. After a minute, she says, you're not dialing the numbers on your sheet. You're switching them. Instead of 463-9257, you just dialed 436-2597. Darn, that happens a lot. Wait, that means, oh my gosh, I know what happened to Mitzi. What are you talking about? Brenna asks. Where's that piece of paper I gave you? The one with the feeding instructions. Taped to the cupboard back... Okay. Taped to the cupboard back in the kennel? Why? No time to explain. I sprint to the kennel and find the chart. I take a deep breath and carefully read what I wrote. Yup, I was right. I switched the numbers. Brenna fed Mitzi exactly what I wrote down, but I wrote down 5.2 scoops of dry food a day instead of 2.5 scoops a day. We're lucky it wasn't more serious. I lean against the wall. Mitzi got hurt because of my mistake. I put a patient in danger. Maggie, Maggie, Sunita shouts. David found the puppy cellar. 